province of Ontario. Area, more than 400,000 square miles. Population, only about 7 million. In the north, vast areas of almost unpopulated wilderness, land of great potential wealth, still largely unrealized. The object of several geological operations in recent years by the Ontario Department of Mines was to complete a geological reconnaissance of large tracts of little known and hard to reach territory in a matter of weeks. Also to gain the maximum knowledge of geological structure and mineral potential and to make that knowledge available to prospectors, exploration companies and mining companies in the shortest possible time. A total of more than 70,000 square miles, an area much greater than all of Ontario south of Sudbury. The reliable bush plane to get the men into the area and keep them supplied during their stay in the remote bush made it possible. And the helicopter, used as a taxi to ferry the men each day from their base camp to the scene of the day's operations. Why these special arrangements? The need is dictated by geography or topography or both. In some cases, the land to be surveyed might be a hundred miles or more from the nearest road or rail line. Most of it is so rugged that it's almost impossible to traverse it on foot. Normally, although it forms part of the great Canadian shield of Precambrian rock, the overburden is thick with too few outcrops to permit normal surface examination. Moreover, between the few surface features that do exist, there is likely to be a morass of swampland or muskeg to effectively block the man who must depend on his own two feet. Operation Capascasing, the first such survey of the Ontario Department of Mines, was conducted in 1966 in an area far to the north of Number 11 Highway. It was made easier by the fact that Ontario Hydro was constructing three huge dams to harness the flow northward of the Mottogamy River. Thus, although an access road and base camp were available, the surrounding country was still almost impenetrable. Here the helicopter provided the answer, made it possible for a few men to accomplish in a single season a job which would have required the same number of men five years of hard labor under normal surveying techniques. Operation Lingman Lake, carried out in 1967, uncovered many secrets of a country which previously had been known to few white men. This was truly a remote land in the northwest corner of the province. 200 miles from the nearest road or railway line. An area peopled principally by Indians. Life for the geologist on this project was strictly a do-it-yourself proposition. There was an added incentive here in that a road was being constructed through that same region to open it for possible future development. With the outstanding success of the first two big surveys, the following year, in 1968, two separate areas were selected for similar treatment. The first, Operation Pocasqua, was launched to gain the necessary geological knowledge of the area along the north shore of Lake Superior so that a decision could be made as to whether the mineral potential was sufficient to exclude the area from Ontario's Provincial Parks program. In 1969, another extensive program supported by helicopter service was launched. Fort Hope, a tiny settlement midway between the Trans-Canada Highway and Hudson Bay. Home base for a few score Indians, whose ancestors roamed this northern territory long before the days of Champlain, Cartier, or Mackenzie. Surrounding Fort Hope, Mile after mile of flat land, stunted trees, myriad lakes, and swamp. The purpose of Operation Fort Hope was to gain an idea of what might lie under the swampland. The clues available to the geologists are few. Rock jutting up through the overburden in isolated cases, or a stretch of shoreline beside a lake or river. Really not much to work on if the surface indications were the only lead to possible mineralization. 
But the present day geologist has advantages that his counterpart of the past never knew. This area was flown a few years ago as part of a program to subject the whole of northern Ontario to an airborne magnetometer survey. Instruments flown over the area in a fixed pattern indicated the presence of different types of rock formations and the possibility of economic forms of mineralization beneath the swampy surface. Now these indications were to be tracked down by geologists on the ground using the time-tried techniques. So here we have a land mass of 16,000 square miles in extent, roughly equal in area to Lake Erie and Lake Ontario combined. Drop about a score of men into the middle of that great stretch of land, water and mud. Tell them that they're to stay there for the next few months and that at the end of the season, they're expected to come out with the notes, information and maps that will enable them to make a complete report on the geology of the entire region. A formidable job? Certainly. A job that promises hours of hard work, of course. Impossible? Certainly not. The area to be covered was as remote from civilization as any in the entire province. Miles and miles of swamp and muskeg, thick undergrowth, few landmarks, and in summer, swarms of voracious black flies. It was not an uninhabited region, for here and there were little Indian settlements. There were a few hardy whites too, government officials, nurses, teachers, priests, and employees of the Hudson's Bay Company. Operation Fort Hope, predicated on the need to cover the largest possible area in the shortest possible time. The basic tool to make this possible was the helicopter, the versatile machine which could land in or take off from an area not much bigger than that encompassed in the sweep of its rotor blade. In an operation of this magnitude, logistics present pressing and impressive problems. A great deal of advanced planning by the chief geologist and his staff is called for the number of men to be fed over a period of weeks, gasoline supplies for the helicopter and fixed wing aircraft, tents, boats, cooking equipment, everything required to make the party self-sustaining under primitive conditions. Leaders of the field parties are selected from experienced members of the geological branch. Other party personnel are recruited from the universities. Briefing sessions ensure that everyone knows and understands what his job is to be. Then off to the job, by air to the lakehead, where complete camp supplies, food, tents, blankets, and instruments for the geological expedition are drawn from the Department of Mines warehouse. Transport trucks and station wagons roll out of the warehouse down the road to the first staging area at Makina. This will be the base point from which the operation will be supplied during the whole season. chartered freighter plane loaded with men and supplies takes off for Fort Hope to begin the operation. And so the job begins.
Fort Hope is regarded by the Department of Indian Affairs and Natural Resources as a textbook example of what a remote Indian settlement should be, with fully adequate housing facilities, school, church, trading center, and other simple amenities for the residents. The immediate program calls for immediate action if they're to be settled in before dark. Final result. It may not be the Ritz, but it'll be home for some time to come. A fair knowledge of bushcraft and the best equipment have gone a long way toward making life comfortable. And the camp cook gives promise of being a popular member of the team. And here the next day is the plain back with another load of initiates. But they came here to do a job, and now they're given the picture of what is expected. This helicopter will be the willing workhorse on Operation Fort Hope for the next four months. It'll serve as an air taxi, transporting the geologists from the base camp to the surrounding rock outcrops from which they will carry out their activities. These machines will land almost anywhere, a patch of rock, a pond, or a clearing in the bush. This rock provides a natural landing and the starting point for the first survey. First, a thorough examination of the starting point to see what the surface rock here reveals. A few interesting samples will go back to camp for closer examination. Then it's time for a traverse of the surrounding bush area. At first, it's open country and the going is fairly easy. And here's something for them to look at. Sometimes, though, things aren't quite so easy. And they find they're no longer alone. And so the first day's work continues. The geological team moves back to the rendezvous with not quite so much spring in their step as they had in the morning. The shores of rivers and lakes are naturally scanned very carefully. For this, no conveyance is better than the old-fashioned canoe, now with paddle power supplemented by a three-horse kicker motor. Something here may be of interest, so keep looking. The afternoon has been interesting, and the work along open shorelines has been less strenuous than it was by helicopter in the morning. Oh. 
This is an important part of the day's agenda. And if the camp cook can maintain this standard for the season, there'll be few objections from his customers. The day's work isn't quite finished yet. Field notes on the day's findings have still to be compiled. Sketch maps must be drawn, and the working base maps must be marked up with current information. And the briefing session for tomorrow's operations. Tomorrow is another day, and with it comes another day's activities. While there may be a sameness to these days and to the activities they encompass, to the man trained to the ways of nature, able to read the story of the rocks, every experience is different, and the thrill of discovery is always new. As running mate for the helicopter, this fixed-wing aircraft is available on call for service in Operation Fort Hope. It sees frequent service running in food, equipment, and supplies needed by the party and carrying mail in both directions. And what office-tied man wouldn't envy a chance like this? Then there are days when scowling skies warn of bad weather ahead for the planes and helicopters. Hard work and unremitting effort have had their effect, so that before the season is very far advanced, all the area within easy reach of the base camp has been covered. It's time to move on to another base. This will be a long day, and it starts early. All personal gear, technical equipment, food and supplies are packed up, ready for loading on the aircraft. The advance party take off. Those that are left behind do a final wrap-up, leaving the camp area in as good condition as they found it. Immediately upon arrival at the new location, the advance party unload and begin to set up the new camp. Now the same routine starts all over again from the new base. Flying. Paddling. Walking. Splashing. Examining. Mapping day after day after day. Regular maintenance of the aircraft in this remote area is essential if accidents are to be avoided and the work is to continue without interruption. Summer wears on. With increased experience, the rate at which work is accomplished speeds up immeasurably. The routine has become a way of life. Now in the evening, there's a nip of frost in the air leaves begin to change color. Birds take wing to warmer climes. Geologists follow suit. From Nakina, everything is shipped to the Department of Mines headquarters in Toronto. Now it's au revoir to the student members of the party. We'll be heading back for another year at university. The job is far from finished. The field notes must be compiled in an orderly manner. The information must be transferred to the base maps. Writing of the preliminary report is the responsibility of the party leaders. The geology is checked with all known previous authorities and the senior geologist in the department. Editing is done as speedily as possible, but with every care to avoid discrepancies. And finally, the preliminary report is ready for distribution. Within a very few months, the final edition will come later. And 
Why all this activity? Why this flying, walking, stumbling over miles and miles of wilderness terrain? Why the rush to translate the information into print? It's been done for one purpose only, to gather all the information possible about a little known section of this enormous province and to make that information available immediately to the people who can put the knowledge to practical use. The ultimate aim, to unlock one of nature's treasure chests so that the wealth hidden there may be used for the benefit of Canadians and all mankind. It was to this end that Operation Fort Hope was launched.